it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos post-game reaction podcast brought to you by Funny Bone Broth. My name is Ben Grant, joined as always by JB as the Toronto Argonauts triumph in Halifax over the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, 30-24 the final. JB, we got a lot to talk about in this game, but before we get to that... I think we'd be remiss if we didn't spend just a, a couple minutes on TD Atlantic as a whole, especially you being out there uh, this week and taking in the festivities and everything else. So before we get to what I think was an amazing football game, tell us what these last few days have been like in Halifax. It's been fantastic. I think one of the things that really made me appreciate is just what a great group of of people and and men, uh, the Toronto Argonauts are, and how you know we can be tough on them and we can expect high performance from them, but you know they're very easy to cheer for. They you know they embraced the Atlantic Province trip. Uh, they were at different clinics with the kids. They signed autographs. They did PR pieces on fishing boats. Um, they they seemed energized to be out east. It was really fantastic to see. I, I don't think it necessarily lit Atlantic Canada on CFL fire, but the entire week and today's game absolutely were a success. Um, some of that probably, in all fairness, to the enormous number of Saskatchewan fans who, who traveled to the game. Uh, but full credit to the CFL, the Argos, and the Riders. They They planned a full week of events, and everybody seemed really into doing it. Um, Success all around. Really, really energized my appreciation of the team. What I was wondering as I watched, and it was was just such a a beautiful atmosphere. I love the East Coast. I think it's extremely beautiful in the summer. And, you know, it's it's got its own uh, uniqueness uh, other times of the year. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, I've been pulling for a team out there for a long time. And as I was watching this, I, I'm thinking, can they just have a 10,000 seat stadium? Because all the talk, like, I don't know if we've talked about, uh, like, Justin Dunk's interview that he had with the, the mayor of Halifax and how that just didn't look like it's anything at all politically that anyone's thinking about. But they keep talking about, and the CFL keeps talking about 20 and 25,000 seat stadiums. The Toronto Argonauts are, are drawing around 10,000 right now in their home field. Can you not just have a 10,000 seat stadium in Halifax and fill it to the brim and you would get so many road fans as well, especially during the summer months. Uh, I just, I feel like that's got to be the way to at least start things. Uh, yes. The short answer. Uh, the, the reality is the stadium needs to be on the peninsula. Uh, there's not much space. If you're going to have one, it's probably going to be, where the Canadian Soccer League team plays right now, you could probably figure out a way to engineer what Acadia did today and have a 10,000-seater. Halifax sells out 10,000-seat Moosehead games all winter. Uh, it is 100% a workable model and would, you know, would have a great impact on downtown businesses. Um, if the CFL can get past just a 10,000-seat stadium, just because we want the team here, and if it's successful, then down the road, maybe we look at a larger, more permanent, bigger stadium. I think you have to look at it in phases. What has to happen, I think, is a couple of things. I have to get two into this. Uh, number one, they have to have a game in Halifax. Right? You've got to build the – Halifax is not, as somebody from here, is not a CFL hotspot. There's no history – there's no connection. Nobody in Halifax, except people who have moved from Toronto or other provinces, cares about the CFL. So it's not a rich target. But if you brought games to the peninsula and people had a great time and people were, you know, having, you know, going out and the big groups of people having some, some, some good times at establishments and then went to the game that could build an appetite. I think that's step one. And then step two is they have to find a rich person 
who is going to uh, pinpoint this thing. You have to have somebody who has money, who is going to lay out the plan for people, who is going to eat uh, at least most of the the expense, um, you know, make the argument to the people. The argument has not been made to Halifax. And for the most part, it is not a traction item because nobody in Halifax cares about the CFL. So you got to, you have to build that and that can happen next year by bringing back the team to Halifax, not Wolfville. Let's get into the pregame stuff. You were saying that it was a predominantly Rough Rider uh, stadium. Did it did it feel very much like a, a road game for the Argos today? Oh yeah, uh, I talking to you and, and and my dad and some other people who who watched the game on TV. I'm t- I was in the stadium. I'm telling you, it was ninety percent Rider fan, seven percent neutrals, and then twenty five people and Pinball Clemens uh, for the Argos. When the Argos had the ball, it was loud, especially in the red zone. Loud, loud, loud. And when Saskatchewan had the ball, I could have yelled anything I wanted to Fajardo, and he would have heard me. <laughs> I thought about it. I'm not going to lie. I thought about it. It was that quiet. I've, it's, I mean, the, to, the, the home enter, you know, the, the, the speaker, uh, you know, the announcer and music system, just gave up on it being a home game and and I think probably rightfully treated it like a neutral site game and cheered for both sides and you know and then that was probably the way to play it in truth because if they said who wants the Argos it would have been very quiet <laughs> very it's, quiet it's pretty awkward for for public address I, i've been a public address announcer when there's been like five people in the stadium and it feels similar there was no uh, chance there were more than 50 argo jerseys at the game no chance i would give zero percent chance more than 50. well but, it was a pretty but, cool event it was it was <laughs> but that's okay you know you can't you're not gonna build you know like you, you gotta that doesn't mean that it can't succeed here it's just you have to you have to build it up you know it's like uh, Jacksonville in London yeah no I agree and I actually don't think it's necessarily a bad thing like Toronto fans from Toronto can can go to games in Toronto they don't need to travel to Halifax to go see it whereas like the Saskatchewan fans they would have come to Toronto anyway like they would have made that sure. that trip if you're in Saskatchewan if you're in Saskatchewan I would assume that you were looking to leave as many times as you can over the course of a year. <laughs> Let's talk about the one event that I think is going to be talked about from this game more than it probably should be because it's such a great game. This was this was a wonderful football game. Start to finish, I thought it was an exciting game. Unfortunately, what's going to be talked about most is an incident that happened pregame between Duke Williams and uh, Shaq Richardson. So the way that we saw this breakdown, and maybe you can shed a bit more light on this too, the camera is following Coach Dinwiddie, and he suddenly sort of breaks into a run, and he arrives on the scene slightly on the side of the field of the Rough Riders, where you've got Banks trying to separate Duke Williams and Shaq Richardson, and then Williams picks up Shaq's helmet, which is on the ground for some reason, and throws it at his face. And then the coaches intervene. They break everybody up. Now, we don't know exactly what happened on the on the TV broadcast. We don't know what happened that led to that. I assume it didn't start that way. Something happened before that. But we don't have footage of it. So, you know, what's being said? What's being talked about? Uh, yeah, I, I caught just the end of it, too, actually. I caught the pushing and shoving. And then it was broken down. Um, at the post-game presser, uh, you know, Coach Adimity and uh, and Enoch Wamba both said that um, that uh, Duke spit at Shaq twice during the game, on top of swinging the helmet at him. So you know, can they prove it by video? Who knows? There's no reason for anybody to lie. So I, I'm assuming that Duke is going to get suspended because you know he. Spitting on another person is 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 violence, you know, to a degree that, of course, Shaq was going to uh, react the way he did. That I mean, I, there's almost nothing more um, disrespectful and um, 
vile than you can do. And this goes back to their days when Shaq's playing in Calgary, Williams playing in Edmonton, and I guess they had some some run-ins uh, during during those years as well, uh, and that sort of well, led to what we had today. I'll tell you, this was a classic Hamilton, Toronto. I'm going to take your goddamn head off football. This was one violent football game. They this game had more hits in it than I've seen all season. It was absolutely uh, fantastic. You know, really, almost everything very clean, but if you threw underneath, you were getting annihilated. Both sides, it was a street brawl. Man, what a football game. And we felt it was going to go like that leading into this week. Uh, having gone to practice earlier in the week in Toronto and then you going to practice in, in Halifax or, or Dartmouth or wherever they were practicing this week, we both felt like the mood was business. This was a team ready to take care of things, and they looked like that when they arrived on the field, I assume, today. Yeah, exactly. I know I picked, uh, you know, I'm turning it into a bit of a cooler with my picks, um, but I, I had picked Saskatchewan simply because I thought the home field tip the balance and it was a home field I wasn't wrong in my defense uh however as soon as that team walked on the field today as I tweeted as I'm not want to tweet but as I tweeted they looked I mean as a coach I've seen teams that are ready to play ball and that's what it looked like this was a team you can't fake it you just have the electricity the juice they were loose. They were ready. They wanted to go out and ball. Um, it was fantastic to watch it. I felt as long as they didn't have a heartbreaking mistake in the first five minutes that they were going to win the football game because that team looked like a confident, um, a confident, physical, fast team. And, you know, I'll get to where I think that came from uh, a little later. Well, right off the bat, as we got into the the first quarter, I actually felt like they were almost too ready. Like they just seemed so explosive. We got the offside penalty on on Chris Edwards early because he was he was called on a blitz, and you could see his first game back. You know, he's been ready to go for for Sha- months Sha- now. Shaq came on a blitz. <laughs> if they had run, I was it was early in the game. If they had run towards him he would have killed that guy he came on that blitz with a a ferocity that was breathtaking uh oh oh my god they were shot out of a cannon to start that game yeah and there were a few actually i loved how many and this is i i was sort of joking on twitter that coach dinwiddie has been listening to our podcast because a lot of things that we've been asking for happened today and i don't think that's why I think no. it's just that you know we see things and they also see things and and they they happen to coincide. But like we've been asking for halfback blitzes and and boundary corner blitzes and there was a ton of them today. When's the last time you saw Shaq blitz like three times in a game, which he did today? It just doesn't happen a lot. And they brought so much pressure off the edge, and, and it really caused problems. And a couple of times like where Shaq, for instance, blitzed on the wrong side, he still was able to come around and make the tackle on a running play because he's coming with so much gas and there's nobody to pick him no, up. That's so, exactly what happened. But, whoo, man, there, if that had been a rollout or something to his side, oh, my Jesus. So Saskatchewan did hold things together kind of in that opening drive. They end up missing a 42-yard field goal for the single. Uh, they added a, a field goal a little bit later in the quarter, 4 nothing. Uh, the Riders were off to, uh, you know, kind of a slow start, they, but not as slow as the Toronto offense. They just could not get going that first quarter. It just seemed like nothing was going right at all. And then suddenly when we just flipped the page to the second quarter, that's when McLeod Bethel-Thompson puts a fantastic 70-yard drive together. He ends up hitting Devaris Daniels for that seven-yard touchdown. This beautiful, when he let go of it, I was thinking, because I knew where I knew where Daniels was lined up to start the play. And when he let that ball go off, I'm like, what kind of route did Daniels run where he's throwing that sort of moon ball to the corner of the end zone? He basically ran like a running back uh, wheel and ended up in the corner of the end zone uh, for the touchdown catch. Argos are up 7-4. It was a, a huge game from Devaris Daniels today uh, with 70 yards and a touchdown. We've been asking for this for a long time. Yeah, he looked great. I'd, I'd love 
he and Macbeth to get a little more chemistry because clearly, you know, from his salary and his athletic ability, Daniels can be a star. He still is not used the way other teams, you know, whether it be Whitehead or Lawler or whoever, he's still not used as like option A enough to my mind that like, you know, I don't, anyways, I, I mean, I'm in a very positive mood, so I'm not going to go down that road. Um, <laughs> I wonder if the crowd noise surprised them. It, it was really loud. Like they definitely had to go silent count. It when we were when the when the Argos were uh, at a couple of times, basically pinned inside their own twenty when they started. I, I wonder if that threw them because it was really loud, and I don't know necessarily if they were ready for a silent count. And maybe that is the slow start. That's what you yeah think? maybe. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I hadn't thought about that possibility, but they definitely adjusted. After that first quarter, they looked far more together. And the offense actually played really well after that first quarter. But yeah, it was a, it was a pretty slow start. We got into some controversy in the second quarter. Uh, Oakman, who had a tremendous game today, sacked uh, Cody Fajardo. And Fajardo hurt his knee. His knee's been banged up for a while. He's been wearing that brace. And... They reviewed this to see if this was rough in the passer. It was not. And I think that's that's the correct call. Open was held on the play, which was called. And he was sort of thrown to the ground. And then from the ground, he essentially crawled up to Fajardo and pulled him down by his legs. That's not the same as hitting a quarterback low. I think some of the problem that people had with that hit was that Fajardo had let go of the ball. Uh, from Oakman lying on the ground, it's obviously hard for him to see when that occurs. But I, I think ultimately the right call was made and that that's not roughing the passer. That's you've got to punish the hold there. But it did kind of <laughs> not that not that that set the tone. The tone was already set, but that continued um, this sort of uh, it just felt it felt I was on edge the whole game. I just felt like something was going to explode every every two minutes. So that didn't that didn't ease things at all. So they end up kicking a field goal at 7-7. Seven, seven. And then there was an interesting play I just want to talk about for a second because I actually thought this was not bad strategy. So McLeod Bethel-Thompson throws his only interception of the game. And this I don't actually pin on him because to me this was a strategic interception. It's second and 25. Yeah, it was, it was an arm, we, 100% arm punt. Yeah, that's all this is. And I think that's like people were on him a little bit on social media. And I just think that's, I think that was the plan because you've got your your plan A is that pass interference calls you you see those on deep balls far more than you see second and 25 converting so that in itself is worth the gamble but then you, know, you throw it up nice and high like that you know that the, if it's not if you're, your guy's not going to come down with it and it's not going to be pi that's probably going to be intercepted and he'll be tackled right away it ends up being a 44 yard punt with no return the way that Saskatchewan was returning, I actually thought this was a great play. And so the interception, in, instead of being a negative, uh, and it's unfortunate that it shows up this way in the stat sheet, but to me, that's almost like a, a sacrifice bunt that shouldn't shouldn't count as an out. Um, that that really shouldn't be a pick to me, but I, I thought that was a heads up play. Yeah, me too. And then there was a, a pretty, pretty interesting moment where... I think Argos fans were just thinking to themselves, oh, no, you know, not not again. But Cloud Bethel Thompson launches a ball for Banks, who's wide open uh, right in the middle of the end zone, uh, ends up dropping it, uh, you know, running into the post. He's uh, contacts made with him by the defender at that moment. Really, that ball needed more gas on it. McLeod Bethel Thompson lofted it and that needed to be on a rope because Banks was wide open, but the halfback was closing fast. And so... You know, the pass goes incomplete. But then on the very next play, he launches one for Cam Phillips. There's a bust in coverage and he goes 40 yards into the end zone. Argos are up 14-7. That was a huge momentum swing. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think that's Banks' game now at this point in his career. I love him as quick over the middle passes. Uh, you know, I, I don't love him as much as deep long passes but uh, I, I thought the Phillips touchdown after that mistake immediately after uh, absolutely changed the momentum um, of of the game 
And to me, the the bust, the, we got a, an interesting explanation from from Suter on that. And I, I do trust Suter on his analysis, especially of defensive back play, because he was a defensive back. But uh, to me, that looked like cover zero, and it was just one guy didn't get the call. It looked like the halfback didn't know it was cover zero. He looked like he had flats. Everyone else looked locked up in zero. And and that's why Phillips just went running by. But, you know, it, it, it's hard to know without without all 24 film and, you know, without knowing the play call. But regardless, Toronto's up 14-7. And then the air gets taken out of the sails because the kickoff goes out of bounds. Now suddenly fajardo has got great field position. Uh, this, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, anger's the wrong word, but th- there's a lot of frustration being directed on social media towards Boris Beatty, who was called Warren Beatty today uh, by the broadcast team by accident. <laughs> Uh, that was a funny slip that no one else seemed yeah, to pick well, up on. That's a great, uh, that's a great compliment. He's a he's a terrific movie star. Wonderful movie star. Anyway, so uh, yeah, he kicks it out of bounds. But I, I guess the wind was way more an issue than we got a sense of on the on the broadcast. It, it was uh, never windy, but it was gusty. Uh, the definitely there were definitely like you would have you could see the flags would suddenly shift. So for sure. Uh, and look, r- r- later in the game, Ottawa or Ottawa, <laughs> later in the game, Saskatchewan uh, returned the favor and uh, <clears throat> kicked it out of bounds. So yeah, you got both both kickers kicking one out of bounds. You got both kickers missing a, a forty-two yard field goal, uh, and and one of the ones that BD hit, it actually looked like once it went through, there was a sudden gust of wind, so it went like straight and true through the middle. And then in the last like 20 yards that it traveled, it suddenly blew like way out of the screen just because a gust of wind came along. And, yeah, yeah it, it was definitely gusty. So I, I think that's, I'll give him a pass there. So for Jardo Engineers, a touchdown drive. Morrow was just lights out. He disappeared for the rest of the game after that. When he, he tied it up, 14-14, a touchdown pass from Fajardo. He had a beautiful run on a third and one. Uh, he ended up catching that pass for a touchdown. He looked lights out in that first half. He got hit and then, really hard on that touchdown. <laughs> he really did. Hard. He did. And they were sort of looking for him the rest of the game, too. They they shifted their, their defensive strategy. They weren't letting him run the same way. They... Um, you know, Saskatchewan also, you know, was having trouble sustaining drives uh, a little bit after that too. So uh, we just didn't see as, as much of, of Morrow, but, uh, yeah, that was a great drive from him. And then right before halftime, uh, Bethel Thompson puts together a, a fantastic drive of his own and Toronto's looking to score a, a touchdown before the end of the half to go up 21, 14, but they stall, uh, basically at the five yard line. Why I was really frustrated here is that McLeod Bethel Thompson threw one out to Banks, and Banks caught it and rolled out of bounds. To me, and I, I don't know the exact wording of the rule on this, but to me that should stop the clock. Now, it did temporarily, but they were going to whistle it back in again and start the clock, and Toronto had to call a timeout there. I guess the way that they do it, if you're coming back to the line of scrimmage, so if you catch a ball and you're coming back to the line of scrimmage and step out of bounds, it's supposed to run. Now, under two minutes, it rarely does. I was just really surprised at that. The timeout, the lost timeout, didn't end up costing Toronto. But if that had come down to the wire at the end of the game and they needed another timeout, I was going to go back to that play because that just seemed unfortunate. So they couldn't they couldn't cash in on that. They end up um, kicking a field goal and took a 17-14 halftime lead. And you said on Twitter that was the best half of Argos football you've seen this year. Yeah, absolutely. I thought... That the offense started slowly, but this, they're playing a very good football team. By far the best football team, although Winnipeg has now seemingly gone into overdrive. But this <laughs> overdrive Winnipeg team is not the one that came to Toronto. Uh, I think this is the best football team that Toronto played, and I thought they went punch for punch with them and you know stayed in the game, and the offense got their act together and got it going. Um yeah, I, I really felt like it was a heavyweight fight and we were going punch for punch with the at least the second best team in the league. It felt like that. It's hard to say, though, because BC also looked amazing when they played Toronto. But it, it certainly Saskatchewan is up there with them. Now, they're not fully staffed today. They were missing a couple guys. We've talked about that before. But it's a good team and a great defense. And so you've got to be, and essentially playing at home, 
uh, in Halifax. So you've got to be really happy. 17-14 at, at halftime, I thought was great. They made some really nice adjustments uh, in this game. So one I thought was uh, in the second half, really allowing McLeod Bethel-Thompson, allowing is the wrong word, having McLeod Bethel-Thompson take off sometimes when Saskatchewan would drop their backers so far off. Because he's not a running quarterback, Saskatchewan was sort of cheating a little bit. So linebackers would take their read steps, and as soon as they saw it was a passing play, they would bail out 20 yards downfield. They were really fanning themselves and leaving all sorts of space in the middle because McLeod's not a runner. You wouldn't do that against a running quarterback. You wouldn't see them play like that against Rourke, for example, or or Ford, certainly. Um, And Macbeth was taking advantage of it. So he started stepping up and he was getting 10-yard runs. He ended up, up, at one point, he was Toronto's leading rusher. He ended the day five carries for 32 yards, which is a nice uh, 6.4 yards per carry average. But that really helped extend a few drives. And to start that second half, he had a big running play there. We ended up stalling with a high snap. It was a snap that just Uh. looked like it it, it got away from Lawrence. That ends up being a 14-yard loss. And BD ends up kicking that 41-yard field goal that blew all over the place before going through. But it's, it's 20 to 14 Argos at that point, but that really felt like it was going to be a touchdown drive. Oh, I mean, a couple things. I'm not, you know, Bethel Thompson said in the press conference after to a question, he, he thought it was a very poorly refereed game. He, in fact, mentioned that he, uh, you know, well, I, I, anyways, but, but felt it, it was not, I will say as an observer, I thought it was not a well-refereed game. So there were a lot of terrible calls, um, going back to your conversation about, you know, the end of the first half. Um, Harris was, at, you know, again, in the pregame warm-up, the two guys who looked like they were about to fight the world, um, it was the CN Power and Harris. I, I mean, Harris came out with the punters. Like he was ready to start that football game, and he was going, you know, really, he was really, I, he, not angry at the team, just really frustrated that they couldn't get any run going because Saskatchewan absolutely was filling the box. I, I it, it wasn't that he was, I mean, some of it was anger at the team, but it was more, I think, just his desire to get the run going. I th- he Look, he looks great. Um, we've got to get him a touchdown. I thought for sure today was going to be the, his touchdown because he, God, he runs so hard. On the play he ran for the record, he got oh, yeah. annihilated. Yeah, but that man, was he something. just re- he, he, he just gives the offense a an edge and a violence and a toughness that they absolutely need. When he gets going, he's just a raging bull of a man. And it's you, you can't stop him in his tracks. I know. He, he ends up he ended up jumping, I think, in that one just to get those few extra yards. But he always finds a way to get those few extra yards. It was tough. That's what makes him so special. They loaded up against him, and the inside. Yeah, that was their test. clearly Saskatchewan's game plan was: we are reading run. Everyone, all twelve defenders, you are reading run for the first second of this play, and you are staring right at Andrew Harris. And then if he doesn't have the but, ball after a second, everyone is bailing and out. And full credit, the Argos. Torched them deep. Yeah, yeah, they kept doing that. They sent these run blitzes that they, you know, just kept taking advantage of, or at least trying to, and it cashed in a few times. So I thought they adjusted really well to uh, to that. And I think teams going forward, like next week in Saskatchewan, you're not going to see them play the same way. And I bet you Harris has a pretty big game next week because coming off of this, they're going to be looking at the film and nothing Harris did will really stand out to them. It's not like they forget about who he is or anything like that, but now you're trying to adjust for what you saw and you're trying to take away those deep passes. And Toronto had a few new concepts that we haven't seen before. They had a really nice... Uh, it was, I don't know, I didn't see the full concept. It, it looked like part of a dagger concept, but I, I don't know what was going on on the other side of the field. But basically you had Daniels cutting in uh, underneath a, a go route and, and all sorts of space was there. It was a really nice deep concept that we've seen them run in practice, but they haven't actually put out in a game yet. And it was really neat to see some of that stuff work off of these these run blitzes where guys just weren't getting through and it was leaving a huge hole in the middle of the field. So some really nice adjustments there. There was a controversial play again in the third quarter. And just to address the officiating that, that you said, I, I didn't think it was a well-officiated game today. I don't. Th- there was no agenda or anything like that. I think the calls sort of evened out in the end, but 
it just it just wasn't good and even the fact that they didn't put a stop to some of the antics early on uh going right back to duke williams pre-game i think something probably should have been done and this game kind of got out of hand at times and i do put that on the officials i think you're going to see a really tight whistle i think you're going to see a lot of early flags next week because that crew next week is going to want to set the tone before this game gets out of hand yeah, so there were there were two absolutely abysmal calls um one was the fajardo roughing the passer where they said he 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 crossed the line of scrimmage but then he was roughed and then when the coaches asked well how is that possible the referee said well he was roughed before he crossed the line of scrimmage roughed so right. much that he was able to throw the ball roughed all the way downfield two yards yeah. beyond the line like, of scrimmage so that's it, and you can't that's how do you rough a passer when he still got the ball though that's embarrassing if it was, right like a hit around the waist. None of that made any sense. The explanation didn't make sense. And that's the play we're at now. Yeah, that's the controversy I was, was talking about. He was roughed before the line of scrimmage. Like, wh- how? And, and so that was abysmal. And then there was a, a, a scene where, um, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Blake. There was, a, a, or maybe it was Dejan, um, who was grabbed by, clearly, like had his head grabbed by the riders, D lineman. And then they gave it to offsetting. And you're like, how is that possibly offsetting? Like, it was clearly he had him and he was kind of whipping him around. So, I don't know. There was, there was some really, there were some really bad calls. On top of what was brought up in the post-conference was the uh, coach's challenge that I think people were led to believe that they were challenging the banks uh, but in fact, they weren't challenging the banks. They were challenging another player who had been tackled. Uh, but the referees looked at the banks play. And so I got a bit of clarity on that. I looked into that after the game. So what happened on that play is Dinwiddie and the whole Argos bench is pointing right as Deveris Daniels gets dragged to the ground. He was running out of the slot. And we never even got a chance to see what route it was because the defender basically grabbed him by the jersey and threw him to the ground right. about 15 yards downfield. And so that's the whole bench is pointing to that. Dinwiddie's pointing to that. That should have been flagged for illegal contact. So Dinwiddie immediately throws out his challenge flag because he sees it right in front of him. He's like, oh, I know that's going to be called. However, the CFL changed the rule a while back where you can no longer, and I was reminded um, of this by Ravi on, on Twitter, you can no longer challenge an illegal contact play. You can only challenge a pass interference play. So because Daniels wasn't targeted with the ball, they couldn't actually challenge that. And so you also can't pick up your challenge flag. So the referees did end up reviewing the bank's pass interference because that's the only thing they could have reviewed with regards to pass interference on that play, which to me seems like a failing in the rule although i get why because remember a few years ago it was getting a bit ridiculous where we would have these like uh, no um, i agree i mean that it makes sense the dartboard challenges you, you right? can't you can't relitigate every play right so i i get it but yeah well anyways let's, let's stay on the positive tip here yes exactly so moving to the to the fourth quarter it, it's it's now, uh, Toronto's up, they get a rouge, Toronto's up, and Boris Beatty uh, missed a, a 41 yard of it, uh, or 42 yard, or I think that, that blew all over the place. They get the rouge out of it. It ends up being 21 14, and Saskatchewan ties it up on a Duke Williams 32 yard touchdown that was just masterfully done by Cody Fajardo. He absolutely moved pieces around with his eyes, with his body and created all sorts of space in the middle of the field threw out the pass to duke williams who just like walked in uh ambles was there but he was wrong footed uh on the play and again that's a credit to Fajardo too so williams gets the touchdown and we're thinking at that point is this going to come down to a duke williams score that makes the difference in this game after all the controversy people saying he shouldn't have even been in the game at that point is that what's going to do it because now it's tied at 21 there's nine minutes to go and uh it 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 looked it looked like things were starting to unwind. McLeod Bethel Thompson had been playing really well. He'd had a really nice streak, and suddenly he started throwing balls high. He couldn't keep them down. And every these wide open receivers, he was reading them perfectly, and then he was just sailing the football over their heads. There was one to Banks, there was one to Gittins Jr., and they just they couldn't couldn't could barely get a hand on it. And Saskatchewan ends up kicking the go-ahead field goal. They're up 24-21. 
and it felt pretty dire at this point, I got to say. Yeah, uh, for sure. There there was a little stretch there where he, uh, you know, uh, Bethel Thompson was definitely, uh, the ball was getting away from him a little bit. He was skying it a little bit um, when he was trying to put a little extra heat on it. Uh, it, uh, But I felt really, uh, I I did feel confident in the defense. Uh, I thought that the defensive line got a little tired in the second half. But I felt confident in the defense, really. And I think the defense did, too. And I really feel so much of that is the addition of Chris Edwards. It, it, it was as transformative as we hoped it would be. And you talked to me about Winter McManus, basically at this stage of the game, going up and down the Argos sideline, getting guys fired up when they really needed to be. He certainly didn't feel like the game was over. He knew they had a job to do to get the ball back. Yeah, he, he, you know, when uh, Saskatchewan scored and he, you know, he was going up and down the bench and telling guys, like, it's not over, we're not dead. He, that's, that's what leaders do. Like, he, he, you know, he comes from a successful program. You know, he, he, like, it's okay to give up a late score. It doesn't mean you have to hang your head and here we go again, we're going to lose. We're a bunch of losers. Uh, you know, and and look, you know, and he did what captains do. He he took care of business himself. Yeah, he made a heck of a play. So Saskatchewan's got a second down. Uh, Fajardo's reading the defense correctly, I might add. He's he reads uh, cover three cut, and they've got a hook route to the slot back, which should be wide open every time. But McManus is reading that too, and right from the snap of the ball, he lasers over there. Fajardo doesn't put quite enough on it. McManus. Uh, undercuts the route, picks it off, and he he takes this in. I, I want to. I don't know if this was going through your mind the way it was going through my mind, but when McManus intercepted that football, all I was thinking is he needs to score here because we've seen so many red zone struggles, and you know the offense was playing well today, and I don't want to beg on the offense, especially when they had you know such a such a good game and came through so many different times, but it was a long way for a linebacker to run a 50 yard interception return touchdown. But I was thinking as he was running, like you, you've got to get this in. You've got to get this in. I don't know if we're going to be able to get it in if, if he doesn't. And sure enough, he was able to run it all the way in to get the two point conversion, a pass to banks. And that's something that has eluded them as well. Two point conversions were not a good thing for the Argos last season. So that was nice to see Argos up 30, 24, but there's time left. There's still two minutes to go about two minutes to go. Uh, and Fajardo ends up getting picked off on, again, a weird circus play, almost like the Banks play we saw last week. A little different, though. The ball gets tipped. Shaq Richardson catches it with his legs and then kind of flicks it up to his hands as he's falling down. And it seemed fitting that Shaq is the one who ends the game. Argos win 30-24. They can kneel down, uh, kneel at the clock from uh, from then on in, uh, but what what a what a win! What a way to end that game! Yeah, more than just a win. It 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 felt like the culmination of a transformational week. That they had a brutal loss, and things can go sideways with a loss like that. And it was probably the perfect time for a road trip, and and some bonding, and they were you know they understood the talent they had and that they could ball with anybody if they played their game and practice like it all week. They practice sharp. They practice loose. Um, they came out, warm up, look great. Just it, it, just the win felt like the culmination of an entire week of, of getting this team on track and not whatever it was we saw the first couple of weeks. It was like flashes, but not good football. This was a good football game today. The Riders played well today, and and Toronto, you know, took their punches and came out on top. Uh, I just couldn't be um, more excited with what this team looks like. It really felt like one of those games that defines a season and sets a season in a new direction. I think that's yeah. Doesn't what mean you're they're going to go win nine games in a row now. Uh, I think it just sets the baseline of what this team knows they can do. Yeah, knowing who you are is big. And seeing a game like this, being able to go back to the locker room, look around at each other and say, you know, we had each other's backs today. There was a beautiful moment 
after that McManus interception return, he's celebrating and everything else. He gets back to the to the bench and he's he's gassed. And McLeod Bethel Thompson comes up to him. And if you didn't know the context, you might think that he was asking for all his money. He grabbed uh, McManus by the chest pad and started shaking him. And he was like right in his face. Uh, but it, what he's saying there is, is you know, like basically like that's you're you're a leader. Like this is what like you said, this is what leaders do. You did it. We owe you one. That was amazing. You just won us the football game on that. And McLeod Bethel Thompson, seeing the energy from him. I talked about it in my film piece last week. There's a thousand reasons that guys love playing for him. But when you see the quarterback go screaming down the bench to go and congratulate, aggressively congratulate uh, the linebacker who just ran back that pick six to win the game. Uh, he knew how big that was, how much that meant to the team. And to see those two guys together was was pretty special. That was really cool. Let's do our offensive and defensive players of the game. So offensive player of the game, where are you going to go for, for this one, JB? <laughs> I mean, part of me wants to go Harris because he plays offensive. He plays offense like a linebacker. And God, I just, I love it. I love his edge. I love his physicality. I love his uh, anger. I love how well he lays contact. Man, as a, I'm not a big fan of offensive players in general, um, but he he is an offensive player. I I, I respect. So having said that, um, I'm not going to give it to Harris, uh, but I I think the play of the game, or one of the big plays of the game, was the Phillips touchdown. Thought that was so huge after the banks dropped, knocked down, um, to come back and immediately score that. To you know, Macbeth went back to it. I love the call to go back to it to not just give up after a play where you probably should have had a touchdown, or or, or maybe somebody rammed into the upright. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it to uh, to Cameron Phillips, but I'm gonna say also, but so many people, Bladak was a pass blocking clinic today he is a bad man so you've talked about most of the offense now um <laughs> let me let me throw in some things harris i, I know i knew you can't give it to harris because the stats just simply weren't there but i get what you're saying like he only ran for for 2.6 yards a carry but you still look at it he had a, a terrible game by his standards and he still had 57 all-purpose yards and he was a tone setter he had a couple of really key first down runs he was crushing people he was a physical yeah, presence was, and he's what opened up those passing lanes he's a, what allowed them yeah, it, to get the ball to Phillips. A fire drill in the backfield <laughs> yes it was it was and uh, and a word on uh, Phillips as well. Uh, six for uh, six attempts, uh, six receptions, ninety-four yards, and a touchdown. Uh, he made some great catches. He looked like the guy we saw in all those XFL highlights when they signed Phillips out of the XFL. I was so excited about that signing initially because looking at the film, he was every day was like this for Phillips in the XFL. Yeah. And so if he can get some of that back, you know, we've got receivers coming back soon. You've got Jawan Breskison. You've got Eric Rodgers coming back soon. This is suddenly going to become a, um, a, a very rich position uh, for the Argos to have all these guys that can play. So it was great to see him step up like that. And I think you also got to tip your hat to Devaris Daniels, five receptions on five targets for 70 yards and a touchdown. He had the kind of game that we've been hoping he would have for the last, I don't know, several months. Yeah. yeah uh, I want, look, Banks had 10 targets. 10. Come on. Come on, Argos. I don't want to be the one guy or the one thing, but no. No, sir. Daniels needs some of those targets. That's that's my one that's my one negative comment today. And they went halfway on addressing a criticism that we've had, which was that you shouldn't isolate Banks when you go into quads sets. That because what they'd been doing previously is is Banks was to the other side. I ISO. Today they didn't do that. Banks was to the quad side, but they iso uh, they isoed uh, Ambles, which I just thought was strange because Ambles to me isn't as good a route runner as Devers Daniels. He's a good player, and they used him really effectively in these sort of like uh, crossing patterns off that same set. He'd be running these shallow drags. He got a couple of balls that way, but I would love to see them put Tavares there and all those balls that you're getting, all those targets that you're getting to Banks. It's not that you're not targeting Banks at all. You, you should, but not the way you're targeting Banks. Throw those balls to Tavares. Let him go up and make a play. 
Now, this has been a long-winded uh, circle around back to my offensive player of the game. I'm going for McLeod Bethel-Thompson. Uh, he threw 26 of 36, over 70%, 276 yards, two touchdowns. The one interception, which I said earlier in the show, I don't count as an interception. That's a fantastic day, but more than that, he was a leader out there. He was a tone setter. He was a leader. He was a captain. Everything that he did uh, was a, a positive influence on what we saw from the Toronto Argonauts uh, today. So I thought it was offensive player. I mean, obviously I have bias because I was there and it was a gorgeous day and we beat the Riders. But I thought it was the best, I, certainly the best I've seen him this season. If not the best, uh, not the best stats, but the the best I've seen him as, as a quarterback who I believe could lead a team to a great cup. That's what he looked like today. Yeah, absolutely. And so he's my offensive player of the game. Where are you going for a defensive player of the game? Hmm. Chris Edwards. Chris <laughs> Edwards. Mr. Christopher Edwards brought the blue flame. Uh, look, we talk about penalties, and, and Mwamba talked about it in the, in the pr- presser after the game. Too many penalties. You can't, you can't be the team that people know they can rile up. Uh, you don't want to defeat yourself. 100% that needs to be looked at and controlled. My feeling on the penalties is you can't let it bleed into other guys. You know, sometimes other guys start being like, oh, I'm also a blue flame guy. And no, Chris Edwards and Shaq, though, they are the sharp end of the stick. They are, in football parlance, the greatest compliment you can give to a defensive player. They are dogs. Uh, those guys came out, and you could see it immediately on the defensive ball. That team, Chris Edwards came out, and the violence that he brought made that defense feel like they were the baddest MFs on that field. And absolutely, that's from Chris Edwards. You know, gonna you know, you run blue flame, you're gonna run into problems occasionally, but man. He was everywhere. He laid stick. He changed the personality of that defense. Maybe not change, but he he brought it all together. And, oh, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic Chris Edwards. What I liked from Edwards' presence, uh, aside from all the things you mentioned, is just what they were able to do defensively. It was so much more creative today. They confused Cody Fajardo a couple times. You know, he ends up with three picks. He's, he's, that's not a normal game for him. Uh, he, he was really confused on his first pick where he felt sure, I'm, I'm sure he, he felt like he had a one-on-one coverage down the sideline on a go route. Uh, he had good positioning from his receiver. He didn't see, was it Mechie that came across to to pick it or is Amos? I think it was Mechie that came across to pick it. Um, and it was just a creative roll coverage. It was, I think it was a rolling two. And this is the kind of creative stuff you can do when you've got Edwards uh, in the game where you can have him play pretty much any spot. And it was the way that they used McCoy and Edwards last year. They were sort of doing with Priester and Edwards today. They went with those three-man lines, which were highly effective. And you've got seven DBs in your two linebackers. And, and that, you know, gives you so much flexibility in the defensive secondary, especially when all seven of those DBs really are or can be true DBs and can play yeah. any spot. Edwards had a, a, a defensive pass breakup on a post. Um was teach tape gorgeous it's so hard not to get a pi there just on top of the receiver knocked it down just gorgeous and it looked exactly like the pass breakup he had in practice this week where he was on banks on a deep post route and he was able to drop back into i think he had deep middle on that and followed him through he ended up actually picking that one with one hand but it's the same thing where you know he he, he does this. He can he can be that guy. You know, he can also step up and look very much like a linebacker, too. So, yeah, I tip of the hat to Chris Edwards, to me, player of the game defensively for you. For my defensive player of the game, I'm going Enoch Mwamba. I just felt like he, he, had, he had a great game. He had so many crushing hits, and he just really discouraged uh, the Rough Riders in the second half uh, from running up the middle. Um, and he can do that on his own. He, he was just such a physical presence. He ends up leading the team in tackles. Uh, with six, but he was just uh, absolutely annihilating anybody that came over the middle. And it's not often that you see one guy able to do that. Oh, I, I mean, teams that run that little drop-off pass, 
you know, uh, Saskatchewan ran the drag route early, but they didn't go back to it. No. Because no. you're going to, like, if he doesn't drop 10 yards, you're going to get killed. Uh, which is amazing that they can essentially take a position of the field away. It reminded me, it's a little bit, we're, we're way off topic here, but the way that the way that we saw a young Jack Kassar breaking up teams trying to run option where he could single-handedly go in and just annihilate both quarterback and running back. And he would do it once. And then the team that was running the ball would be like, well, I guess, I guess we're not going to run option anymore for the rest of the game. That was what, you know, that's basically what Enoch Mwamba does with anyone that tries to run a drag route or tries to dive up the middle, anything like that. He's going to take it away from you. Play of the game, JB. Uh, for me, it's the McManus interception. I just don't see how any one play could could stick out more than that. Uh, it, it it won the game. It was a defensive play. It was something that I felt was going to happen all week. We've been calling for it for a long time. We got the defensive interception for the touchdown. That is my play of the game. Uh, what's yours? Uh, I hate to be so obvious. Uh, I loved, it's not my play of the game. I'm going to get it alone. I'm trying not to be long-winded here. Peters had a fantastic deep pass breakup early in the game that just made you feel so confident in the game plan, in the positioning, in the technique. It was just a gorgeous deep pass breakup. And when you have a play like that, it just fires you up because it just shows like the level of athleticism and technique and strategy all working together at the same time for what might seem like a relatively simple deep pass breakup, but absolutely makes the other team feel um, like they're in quicksand when you cover a deep pass that well. Uh, but got to go back to Phillips, uh, you know, to, to go right back to it, to score, to stay in the game, to never let the riders uh, build up a lead or, or have Toronto in a position where they have to pass first which is, of course, a terrible position for any team to be in, especially uh, off from an offensive line point of view. So, yeah, I thought the Phillips touchdown uh, was, was the play of the game. Well, JB, get yourself a uh, lobster dinner and a pint of beach chair and uh, relax after what's been a, a pretty busy few days for you. Uh, we will be coming to you this week on Tuesday as regularly scheduled as we tee up the rematch between the Rough Riders and Argonauts, this time in Regina. Uh, but for now, that will just about do it for us on the Exus and Argos podcast. Look out for JB's report card coming out tomorrow. We'll have some articles coming up later on in the week, and you can get all of that stuff at exusandargos.com. For JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long, and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya. Fight the foe, foe.